Welcome to Levitt Dayton Happy Hour. I'm Amelia Robinson from the Dayton Daily News, and I am so excited to help celebrate all things Levitt and the given season. We hope you had a chance to enjoy some of the music during this Given Tuesday program. There is so much more in store for you. This hour, we have brought together some of the key people that are responsible for bringing the Levitt to Dayton. We welcome your questions as we learn more about the journey, mission, and legacy of the Levitt. Just drop your questions in the chat and we will be sure to share them with our panelists. Right after this program, we will have students showcase from the Fall Levitt Dayton Virtual Songwriting Workshop. We are very excited to hear the songs created by these special young folks, and I know you're gonna love it. Wrapping up things tonight, we will have a celebration of celebrity. We have a happy hour with Tom Higginson of the Plain Right Tees, hosted by Dave Alexander from Mix 107.7. It will include performance and Q&A with our audience. Hopefully you have grabbed some libations from the Barrel House locate, located in downtown Dayton on 3rd Street and you're ready to join our Levitt Dayton Happy Hour. Let me bring in the Executive Director of the Levitt Foundation, Sharon Yalzinski, as well as artist, MC, and Dayton Emmy Award winning host, Rodney Ville. Welcome, guys. Cheers to you both. Cheers. Hello. Cheers. Hi. Hey, Sharon. Hello. Hello. How are you for this? this is going to be so much fun. Great to see you, Amelia. You too. Sharon, I was hoping that you can give us some context to how the Levin Pavilion and its mission began. Absolutely. So I'll tell you the, the story of Mortimer Levitt. It's an inspiring story. First, I'll share that Levitt is all about building community through music. Many of you have experienced Levitt Pavilion Dayton and that incredible community feeling on the lawn. That community feeling happens on lawns across the country. There, there is a national network of Levitt venues and concert sites. We're in 28 cities coast to coast, but we are so proud of our special partnership with Levitt Dayton, which opened in 2018, so just two years ago now. So I'll tell you how this got started. We often get asked, how did the Levitt concept get started? How did all these venues across the country providing free music on open lawn settings so people of all backgrounds and ages to, can connect? How did that start? Well, it all start, had humble beginnings with Mortimer Levitt. So he was raised in, in Brooklyn in the early 20th century, immigrant parents. His family was poor. His father was a street vendor on Coney Island. He sold little butterfly pins. And Mortimer would often go to Coney Island. Luna Park was there and he was dazzled by the lights and the entertainment. But Mortimer was poor, so he he didn't have the opportunity to, to participate in all that the park had to offer. And one thing he couldn't do is he, he couldn't purchase the admission to go to concerts. So Mimi, his widow, Mimi of the Mortimer and Mimi Levitt Foundation, would share how he would sometimes stand outside concert gates listening to the music, but unable to go inside. Eventually, Mortimer had to drop out of high school to help support his family. But he was ambitious and entrepreneurial, and in the 1930s, he launched his own business, the Custom Shop, which was men's made-to-order clothing, and it became wildly successful. By the 1940s, he had made his first million dollars. So it was always part of Mortimer's DNA to give back. And so with his wealth, with his, his success, he became a philanthropist in New York City. Once he met Mimi and they started a family, they had a summer residence in Westport, Connecticut. So in Westport, there was a group of people in the community who decided we need an outdoor venue. So they did a capital campaign. They approached residents of Westport and asked to contribute to the campaign. Well, the Levitts gave the largest private contribution which prompted the town to name this outdoor venue Levitt Pavilion. And that was a surprise to Mimi and Mortimer when they were at the opening that night. The mayor said, welcome to Levitt Pavilion. And Mimi shared that story with me uh, before she passed and she still, it still brought tears to her eyes that the town named the venue after them. And they loved the arts, they loved music. And what started as a modest outdoor venue presenting some amateur entertainment 
throughout the summer evolved to the Levitt program that we know it today, which is 50 free concerts presented to the community every year. And so seeing the success of the Levitt Pavilion in Westport, when Mortimer sold his company in the 90s, he decided he wanted to put the proceeds of the sale into the Family Foundation to create these pavilions across the country, to bring the joy of free music to communities across the country. So he passed the baton to his daughter, Liz, in the early 2000s. She is now our board president of the Levitt Foundation. And we've been working for the last 15, 20 years, bringing the joy of free live music to communities. But all of these venues, all of these concert sites are really community driven. It's the community that brings this concert series to life, that brings the pavilion to life. And, you know, I will say that Mortimer was always really proud that the concerts were free. And even though he's not with us today, I, I know his, 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 we can still feel his pride in how the joy of free live music is, is part of communities across the country. So that's the Levitt story. That's how it all got started. Uh, a generous man who came from humble beginnings, who really believed in sharing the joy of free live music with people across the country. Now that is an amazing story. I did not know all that about the Levitt's backstory and that is truly fascinating. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. Um, they were ahead of their times when it comes to creating placemaking and community building. And that is amazing that we get to relish to that in Dayton. I'm curious to um, this one thing, Rodney, how did uh, we secure a permanent venue for the Levitt Dayton? Well, Amelia, I mean, I, it, Sharon's story like kind of was the inspiration for it because what we did was it was it started at a table, a kitchen table in Gene Barry's house. Um, we had Gene Barry, Diane Siebling, Tom, Michael and Sandy Bashaw, Nick Kuntz Jr. and myself. We talk about a ragtag team of people who come from all different walks of life uh, coming together because Tom brought this idea that there's this great program called Levitt Pavilions. And he said, you know, Dayton should have one. We're like, okay. We're, we all met at Gene's house. You know, we had coffee. Well, we didn't have coffee at wine because um, <laughs> it's Gene. Um, and we sat around. We watched the video of the Levitt story of Mimi and Mortimer. And that story, we just watched the video on this computer. And we all looked at each other and said, Dayton is a perfect fit for Levitt. The fact that we could all sit around, we all just like our jaws dropped. We are like, this would be perfect. And of course, you're talking about a group of people who have no experience with nonprofits and starting projects from the ground. This is, this is so outside of our comfort zone that we, you know, we approached Sharon. I think we called you and said, we're interested. Do you think Dayton would be a good fit? And you said yes. And it started this journey um, of group of people well i know the mayor and i know this person let's do this what about that so it just was this, this amount of a group of people that you would never really think could come together and do something for the community and that's it's kind of like the beloved mission is like bringing people together from all different walks of life and look what good came out of it you know so that's that's the love at dayton story the kitchen table started love at dayton And I'll add to that, when Dayton reached out, the more we learned about Dayton as a city, its philosophy of inclusivity, mm -hmm. it just resonated with our values, with our mission. You know, as you can imagine, we are approached by a number of cities mm -hmm. who believe this program would, would elevate the well-being of, of their, mm -hmm. their, um, their residents their, um, you know, how it can be a catalyst for economic activity. There's all these benefits, this positive ripple effects for the Levitt program. And so we, we go through a vetting process with cities. It's usually two to three years. But in Dayton, the vetting process happened within a year because the values of city leadership, community leadership, all those who are engaged with the process aligned beautifully with Levitt values and that we, we became familiar with leadership's efforts to really revitalize and reimagine the downtown. And many cities are doing that. Many cities have been doing that over the last two decades. Right. But what was different in this conversation was there was a real authentic commitment to creating equitable public spaces, creating spaces in that reimagined downtown where everybody 
everybody was would be welcome and included. And that lawn would be comprised of, of all Daytonians. What was on the stage would be comprised mm-hmm. of all Daytonians. And it would be a full circle experience wow. that was really reflective of the city. That's what truly resonated with Levitt, that beautiful alignment of values. And and I think, you know, adding on to that, Sharon, is like recognizing that someone from the outside recognized that we had all of these gifts laying about that we just needed to bring together. I mean, I think that's really pretty important. And so this is this was really well, for us, like it was like oh, we actually could do this. We could like, actually pull this off. So I mean, the fact that we got to see a love it in action in Memphis. Um, we were uh, with a fabulous meal and it was a great concert. Um, the Baskery sisters? Yes, I believe. Yes. Wow, good memory. Uh, memory. What? Well, but because, well, you know what? You know what stuck out? What really stuck with me was the fact that they were the Swedish um, country alternative <laughs> band of of women, and the audience was a mixed bag of everyone in the community: black, white, young, old, Hispanic, Asian. But they were all there. They had. They, you saw people with picnic baskets. You saw people with lawn chairs. You saw people with who were just there and they stayed after the concert that's what sold that's what that's what we were really like our hearts were like this is what we want that sense of community that sense of staying and then finding out that people became lawn buddies on the lawn and they would they weren't necessarily neighbors in real life but they were neighbors on the lawn and they would meet up on the lawns for concerts so i mean that's come on it doesn't get any better than that (laughs) it doesn't it's i've been with levitt for over a decade, almost 13 years now. And so I've been to hundreds of Levitt concerts across the country. And the opening weekend of Levitt Dayton, I I was there, I was lucky enough to be there for that opening. And, you know, we talk about, we talk about what Levitt's about, you know, people of all backgrounds, of all ages coming together, building community through music. When you're on that lawn, and you see what Rodney just described of people becoming neighbors and connecting whose paths might not cross otherwise, but they're connecting there in that moment and having a shared community experience. You have to pinch yourself. The, the energy is just palpable. The, the positivity of it is just palpable. And that from day one on Levitt Dayton's lawn, that happened. Day one. Yeah. And it's because, you know, Levitt Foundation is a partner. We're a partner. We're your biggest cheerleader. Mm-hmm. But it's the community. Who makes it happen? And this community made it happen. Want to, you know, definitely give a shout out to Mayor Whaley, who was with us in Memphis and and recognized, really was, yeah. recognized um, how this could be a true cultural asset to the city. And um, you're going to hear from the Irelands in in a few minutes. They were, uh, you know, a key driver in leading the capital campaign, leading the effort. It's it's the people on the ground, Rodney, and all those individuals he named earlier who really brought it to life. And then the team, you know, you'll meet Lisa later and, and her whole team that just brings it to life um, every every weekend in the summer and then throughout the year, planning and making it happen and keeping those community relationships alive. Wow. It's it's kudos to David for, for making it happen. Kudos. Well, thank you. No, really cool. Yeah, I just, I just remember how excited everybody was for the Levitt and I continue to be excited. And after one, can't wait to get back out there and dance on that lawn with, my neighbors, new friends. Right. Um, you mentioned you mentioned the Ireland, and I, I should introduce them. I'm going to bring out uh, Jeff Ireland, and he's the board chair, and his lovely wife, um, who is a board trustee, Ellen Ireland, and they have done so much in our community, and they were asked to raise money as part of the capital campaign that Sharon just mentioned. Um, what was it about this project that made you want to get involved and sign on? Uh, well, I guess I'll go first. Um, when I was initially contacted by Mayor Whaley about being involved, I was a skeptic. I said, you know, another music venue. We got lots of music venues in the community and music seems to be successful here. But do we really need another venue downtown. And she said, Jeff, what you need to do is to go to YouTube do an investigation, find out about the Levitt Pavilion, and then come back and talk to me. And so 
that's what I did. I went and I looked into it. And I remember somebody at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, who said, if you ha if your city has an opportunity to have a Levitt Pavilion, don't blow it. And I was like, wow. Um, so I think that the the what resonated with me is what resonates with so many other people is that it's not it's it's about the music, but it's not about the music. It's about inclusion. It's about bringing people together. It's about having people who become lawn buddies. Um, it's about doing something for the city of Dayton, where you know I've worked for 40 years downtown and seen it rise and seen it fall, and I'm now seeing it rise again. And being a being a part of that, and then basically being in a position where fortunately um, knew some people that could help with fundraising, and we were able to get a group together and. Uh, very quickly uh, raise the money, not because we're super great fundraisers, but because the idea had such merit. I mean, it's all about having the product to sell. And we had a great product to sell and a great story to tell as Sharon and, and Rodney have already related. That's your cue, Ellen. <laughs> why do you want to go? Why, why, why do my, why do my cues always work like that? <laughs> so Jeff, Jeff covered kind of the, the start of the approach. So I, I just want to say there, it could not have been more joyful um, starting to work with Mayor Nan and Shelley and their commitment and the city commitment to this project from the get go was so important. And April Mesher was on board immediately as the program ma program manager. And April had always already done all this groundwork um, in the in the start of contacting people. So that part was easy. But what what Jeff didn't mention and I want to I want to mention here is that as as in addition to building the capital campaign and and asking for money, we also were building the organization. And um, the organization was as important um, as the fundraising, because we wanted this organization to be diverse and representative of the entire city in ethnicity and, and all kinds of facets. So we not only looked at um, the opportunity for inclusion for a venue, but we looked at opportunity for inclusion as an organization. And that's still who Levitt Dayton, who, who that's a hallmark of who we are. So as we built the board, um, we also started going out and asking for money. And along with the city, the county came on early um, with a generous gift. And um, our university partners came on early, Sinclair and UD, UD with generous gifts. Um, the Dayton Foundation could not have been more helpful in terms of being our financial advisor and who handled all of our transactions, as well as a generous gift. And then, of course, CareSource. CareSource gave the lead gift um, that made the campaign uh, possible. And um, at that point, once we had their gift, we were over a million, two, we were over two million um, on the way to getting the full five million that we needed. And it really gave us momentum. But from the beginning, whether the gift was <clears throat> $100,000 or $4,000 or $500, every single dollar was important. And especially for those that came on early, they were giving just for something they really didn't know. I mean, we would have them go on YouTube, we would have them go on Levitt National, we would have them go on Memphis, and um, it helped, but it still was something that you couldn't see. So they really had great faith um, in, in the possibilities, and for that, we were really grateful. So um, fast forward, we raised the money quickly. Um, I think Jeff said or somebody said 18 months, which was the fastest any Levitt has raised the money. So Dayton is generous. Um, we have been a generous city for decades, for centuries, and we continue to be. 
And we trust that on Giving Tuesday, people will be as well. Um, and then the next the next thing we started doing was um, looking for a leader. And we started the process of looking for our executive director and um, vetted a number of candidates. And we're thrilled that um, a local leader emerged in Lisa Wagner. And Lisa was hired on, I'm thinking in 2017, and then um, helped with the final fundraising and then worked um, on all the details that April Mesher and, and Kevin Deal were, were handling in terms of construction. Um, and as Sharon said, we opened in 2018, but not before we had had a beginning concert in 2017 um, when they brought through the national tour, which was really exciting and also nerve wracking because we didn't have a stage. We didn't have anything. So we rented a stage and we had a good showing um, for the for something no one knew about. And um, but it was very exciting for all of us who had been boots on the ground for a while. So um, anyway, that's that's kind of the backstory um, leading up until 2018. I know that when people are out there dancing and enjoying the music, they do not know the backstory of Web. It always impresses me that you are able to run, raise so much money so fast. I mean, 18 months is like such a short period of time. So that's really amazing. And if you guys are just joining us, I'm Amelia Robinson from the Dayton Daily News, and I welcome you to the Levitt Dayton Happy Hour. We are learning so much about our Levitt Pavilion. And if you want something uh, asked of our panelists, feel free to drop your question in the chat, and we will get those questions answered for you. Um, we were just talking about Lisa Wagner, but and now I'm going to bring her on to the camera. She's, of course, the dynamic and very awesome and fly executive director of Levitt Pavilion Dayton. And I always love seeing Lisa, especially on a, a nice uh, Saturday or Friday out on, on the pavilion. And hopefully we can be doing that here soon. Lisa. Yes, ma'am. Boy, th that was quite an intro, Amelia. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, wow. let's let's uh, let's put good thoughts to 2021. We we want to come back stronger than ever. So um, thank you for helping make this happen tonight, so we can celebrate our journey and our path forward. So uh, yeah, it's been I'm fun to it's been fun to hear the reminiscing of how this mm -hmm. all came to be and all the partners that made it happen. I'm just always impressed by uh, the camaraderie that you, you find on, on the uh, lawn. People are just so excited. And uh, I know you were excited for it too. Uh, what was planning that first season like for you? It was um, really interesting. I, you know, first and foremost, um, I, you know, it was a startup situation in that we were a young organization um, and we were, supported by an incredible board of trustees and incredible partners in the community. So we dug in real fast. And uh, I, I tell people the story that when we started the programming, I literally had post-it notes of all the different genres that we wanted to be representative in our first season. And as we were talking to agents and artists and booking them, you know, we wanted it to be balanced. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, you know, it, it was very much a kind of a getting input from the community. We, we started with an outreach and community engagement committee because it was so critical to us that we wanted everyone to feel welcomed. Uh, we wanted everyone to realize that this is their pavilion um, and that they are meant to be on the lawn. It's, it's for them to enjoy. So we know that culturally that can look very different for everybody. So we wanted to hear from the voices in our community about how do we frame that? How do we frame the experience? How do we frame our outreach and making sure that we create awareness and bring everybody um, to, to know Fifth and Main as a place of healing and music and dancing? Um, but, you know, it, it was an incredible ride because we weren't just starting construction in January. And thanks to our partners at Shook Construction, we got the keys on the day of our first concert. And um, 
we had an artist performing that night. So we were hustling around cleaning and <laughs> trying to make it presentable. Um, we have the top notch production team that um, they were ready to go. Uh, we, we were ready to do sound check uh, with Gina Chavez, our, our first concert in August of 2018. So, and we did 33 concerts in 49 days in that first um, year. And you know, the, I'll never forget, as exhausted as we all were, there was a moment where our incredible team of Madeline Hart and Abby Brown and I were huddled up together wondering if anybody would show up. You know, you, you don't know because you're obviously you're not selling tickets. So we were kind of holding our breath and boy, oh boy. <laughs> What a night to remember that was. It was incredible to see all those beautiful faces, everybody hugging each other, celebrating that we 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 did it. We we all did it, you know, and, and we continue to write that story together. You know, we we are all part of this Levitt Dayton family. And so um we I get I get excited. I can't wait to continue writing this story with everybody in, in next season. It's like really almost unbelievable that you thought nobody would show up. Well, you know, you just, I'm so used to selling tickets, Amelia. I didn't, <laughs> I thought, oh, you know, people are going to be busy, but oh my gosh, it was not, it was fun. I mean, it was. It was and it's crazy to think that it's just been two years because you have made such a major footprint in, you know, downtown and like everybody just thinks about the Levitt and it's kind of like, you've only been around what, two years? Yeah, so our first full season of 50 concerts was 2019. Wow. And we were obviously, just like everybody else, we were ready to go. We had um, 50 planned for 2020. And uh, we're working on transitioning all those concerts into 2021. So, it, yeah, it is it is very hard to believe that it's it feels like it's been a part of our community for so much longer, um, which is a tribute to our family, our Levitt Dayton family. You know, I think that everybody that's at the venue uh, makes it resonate that way, don't you think? I, I think it's just, I mean, there's some regulars and it was cute in the second season, the regulars are like, um, I really want you to succeed, but like, I don't know that I wanna share this with everybody, you know, and it was cute that they, and they sat like, just like a church, they always sat in the same spot. <laughs> It was, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I can't wait. I missed it so much this year. It is always cool. And I'm going to bring everybody back here, but I wanted to say that it's always cool that you go there and you don't always know about the music. And then you're surprised by how like much you love the music and you how much fun it is. It's all kind of um, just genres and just exposing people to new things, which is really cool. Really dating too. Yeah, we. Um, I, I had a gentleman come up to me in the first season and he said, you know what, I get it now. And I said, what's that? And he said, it doesn't matter if I know who's on stage or not. I know that it's going to be really high caliber, really high quality. And he said, and I get to test genres that maybe I wouldn't have paid a ticket to go see, which I think is so cool, you know, that people can enjoy different types of music that maybe they not might not normally um, enjoy. Now, Jeff, Lisa mentioned the first con concert. What was it like for you to have that first concert actually happen? What did it feel like? Amelia, it was just, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was one of these things that we had been talking about and sort of dreaming about and telling people about. And when it actually happened, it was like, wow. <laughs> and, and I think even that first, I don't know if it was the first weekend or the second weekend, but we had Ruthie Foster in, who's got a nice following. And I can, st I can just remember standing there um, at, towards the end of the concert and looking out and seeing all the people and just thinking, you know, we've been to the Optimist Clubs and the Rotary Clubs and the, this club and the, that club and made all sorts of presentations to people. And you always told them, hey, this is going to be great. We're going to bring a lot of people downtown. It's going to be very diverse, all, uh, all sorts of people represented, all sorts of ages. And they're just going to come together for the music. 
But as you were saying that, you were always thinking, I hope this really works. Because <laughs> you never really know. And then when you actually saw it working, just like you had told people, and just like Sharon had said, and everybody believed that this is this was this was going to happen, it was incredibly moving. You know, and it still is in its own way. But I mean, it's just it's just it's really neat. And when we when Ellen and I went to Memphis, somebody told us, you know, it starts out being about this and that and everything else, but you know, it's it's not about the music. It's about the bringing the people together. And I I, I truly believe that. That's why I think it's such a wonderful thing. Now, so I really, um, the things that kind of stick out in my mind is my favorite moments were, were of course, the, the Dayton Funk All-Stars and then the Breeders Show, which is amazing. Does anybody else want to share some of their favorite moments from the first season or last year? And, um, How about you? Um, oh, go. go ahead, Sharon. Oh, okay. Um, when Blind Boys of Alabama and Paul Thorne were there, and it was, you know, early, I think it was, the, was it the opening weekend? I can't believe it was the opening weekend. And, and um, you know, again, as, as, you know, as Jeff was describing, you just, you look out and you see everybody on the lawn, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all races, all ethnicities. And they sang a song towards the end of their set, which was the love train, like people around the world join hands. And you saw people throughout the audience holding each other's hands, raising them up, swaying back and forth. And to Jeff's point, you're, you're thinking, wow, we've talked about this, this unity that this, this music and this space can create. And then you're seeing it right in front of you. People literally coming together, that unifying force of music being brought to life. And that was that was a very powerful moment for me on, on the Levitt Dayton lawn. Well, I'll chime in. I'll chime in and say that it is one of the joys to have Sharon and Liz in town on the lawn. Because when they're here, they're like little sprites. They are just circulating around and talking to people and getting all these great backstories. And um, we could not we could not be more thrilled um, to be a partner with Levitt National. I mean, they're our backbone. They um, they're here for us at all times. Um, I, I failed to mention when I was talking about fundraising that the fact that they give money to us for 50 years is really what sealed it for so many people that gave money for the facility, is that they knew we had an operating stream of money. They knew that we were not gonna go under. They knew we were supported. So when Sharon and Liz are here with us, it is it is a joy. So um, for me, I'm gonna add on a little bit about the opening night because part of that story was Gina Chavez had lost all of her luggage. So she had nothing to wear. So I think Lisa, it was you that sent her down to um, to the consignment what? to class. To class. class, yeah, Madeline. Yeah. I think Madeline sent her to class. So she had that fabulous dress that she had just found down there, but she was so apologetic about her shoes, which of course, if if you didn't know, it made no difference anyway. But I thought that was such a wonderful story that she just hiked down there to class and got herself a dress and out there she was. So that was a lot of fun. Um, the other thing, I guess for me, anytime kids are up on the stage with the performers, it is just so meaningful to me. Um, when the Dayton Funk All-Stars brought up the kids and, um, and even you know talk about the importance of experiencing music, of experiencing cultural events. It, it really brings home the importance of Levitt, the availability and the ability for us to all have access to things that are important. Um, the concert that was done where the, the artists had been at daybreak for the day, they had gone over there and had spent the day with the kids over at daybreak and they had written a song 
together that they then performed that night or the next night, I can't remember, on stage. And there were probably a group of maybe 10 kids that were involved. There were more that were involved that didn't perform. And seeing them up there and watching the joy they had in the music and in the performance and in knowing really how important they were that evening um, to, the, to the whole crowd was really something that uh, resonated a lot with me. And those kinds of moments um, aren't created in any, but a, in any but an authentic and genuine way. And um, that I think is a lot of, of what Levitt is about. And we're, and we're grateful because the performers that we have, many of them want to go out and do outreach. Um, I've been at a couple of the outreach events in schools where the kids are mesmerized. They can't believe they have people there who are going to show them these instruments that they can, they can actually touch the instruments. They can watch these people perform um, right there in front of them. And, and that has been um, incredibly um, important and meaningful and impressive to me. So um, I guess that's a long winded answer to um, kind of some of the things that have really struck my heart. Um, about Levitt here in Dayton. Ronnie, what's your favorite memory? Um, hey, um, it's so awesome. I mean, it, it was just awesome to see it come to fruition, to see that, you know, we had finally, after a relatively short period of time, bring it together. But what I remember, and I'm hoping this is the first year, uh, Delhi, uh, to Dublin to Delhi, it rained. Yeah, Delhi, were, Delhi to Dublin. Delhi Delhi to, yep. And it rained, but no one left, and they were still dancing out in front of the stage in front of the rain. I remember, yeah, this is that gesture. You know, of course, you know, it was fun to dance. And I, and it was just so amazing. Like, we were trying, like, hey, folks, thunder and lightning, leave. They wanted to stay, and the band wanted to stay on the stage. That just spoke so much to the character of our, our, our community and what our community wanted to embrace. And just seeing that was just like, okay mission accomplished and also too it's like you know one of the really great thoughts is that people when people knew that i had was on the board of love it they would come up to me in that first year and go what's coming next year what's coming next year they were excited they we had just kind of like tapped into some sort of like love joy that they were just like oh they were hooked we 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 kind of hooked them on the drug of love it. And I think that was pretty cool. So that's really nice. That's really nice. Yeah. I want to add on to um, that story also and mention, or actually Ellen's um, thoughts and sharing about education that we've done. Our artists are changed after those events as well. And, you know, Kyle Dillingham, uh, thanks out for the shout out. April um, was absolutely changed from that experience. He said that one of the young men from Daybreak was standing there backstage after the performance and said, boy, I really needed this tonight. And he said, brother, what's what's going on? Like, what, what do you have going on? And he said, well, he mentioned all of these things that um, had happened in his life. And he said, I've been sober for 45 days, but I, I, you know, basically saying that he was getting close to breaking that sobriety and that this presented itself. And, and Kyle just shared with him, you know, that God or whatever it is that you might believe in and a higher power always presents itself. Just make sure that you're kind of looking for it, that that's there if you never need it. And they really bonded. And, um, you know, so it's those moments. I could, I could tell you a million stories like that that happen on the artist side that they share with us, uh, a lot of them are just blown away with what happens on that lawn. And, and um, they wanna come back. I mean, they just, they, they wanna be a part of what it is that we're doing. Um, and Ruthie Foster shared that as well. She, she's like, I play a lot of venues and the venues that I play, white folks sit with white folk and black folk sit with black folk. She's like, whatever y'all are doing here in Dayton, Ohio, this is what we need more of. And that, that was in our first season. And, and she begged to come back in our second season. So um, it was really, really fun to hear it from the artist side as well. 
I think one of the things that's worth emphasizing, especially to folks who don't know everything about the backstory, is that there's a considerable amount of what while the Levitt National and the city and uh, the Levitt Pavilion, our organization, are in a three way contract. The city and, and the local Levitt are given considerable latitude. I mean, there's certain things that we, we have to do 50 concerts a year, and there's certain other requirements that, that we have that are contractual. But once you, you're committed in terms of the design, every one of these Levitts look different. You know, they, they're designed locally by the local group. And what the local group wants to do with their own Levitt is pretty much, you know, you're, you're, you, you, can, you can do it. And so one of the really neat things, I think, about the Levitt Dayton, and it makes it unique to Dayton, is the fact that we have these outreach programs that have been become a port, an important part, an integral part of our, of our culture. And it's something that we, again, we talked about it, and we said this is something that we wanted to do. But then when you actually see it happening, it's like, wow. That is, that's amazing. And that's really, and that's really special. This is all really making me want to go to the Levitt right now. And I can't, <laughs> right? Um, I know everybody else wants to get back to the- Well, the, you the, can, Amelia. You can go and walk through the park and see the beautiful mur mural and Sierra's poem. Sierra's poem. Yeah. Yeah. In the boom box and sit there by myself. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's six feet apart. It'd be kind of kind of nice. I yeah. see. I haven't seen you in so long in person. So, but Lisa, what can people expect um, from twenty twenty one? I know I can't believe we're talking about twenty twenty one already. But I know. I know. Well, it's uh, let's get twenty twenty out of here. Let's <laughs> let's focus on the future, right? Um, you know, we are uh, incredibly grateful for the support of everyone that supported us in 2020 with our virtual um, Love It On Your Lawn concert season, especially the Eichelberger Foundation as our season title sponsor. I mean, uh, we couldn't do what we're doing without the generous support of our sustaining sponsors and, and our donors. Um, that's what this is all about. You know, Giving Tuesday is... We need help uh, to, to get into that 2021 season and get back on that lawn. So please give, and um, we, we hope to see everybody back real soon. So uh, we're planning on a June start uh, just to give time for things in this pandemic to maybe sort itself out. And we are certainly prepared to have safety protocols in place. Um, we, we were ready to do that in 2020. Um, and the county, of course, you know, we, we had some, we had to follow local protocols and, and not open, not activate. So um, we want to keep everybody safe and we plan to have a huge communication plan around that as we, as we go to open. But we are excited about some new things. Um, we want to get out into the community and take Love It on the road and do some pop-up concerts in, in our neighborhoods um, and, and, bridge, you know, show, show them that this is theirs, this is their asset, and, and hopefully they will feel invited. We'll continue some of our community outreach in terms of educational opportunities as um, we see camps maybe coming back online or getting back into the schools in the fall. Uh, but we're really excited to be partnering with um, our treasure, our community treasure, um, Sierra Leone in doing a urban creative um, arts camp at the Levitt this summer. So we're really, really excited about elevating these young voices in, in our community. And so look for more information coming down the line about that. Um, so there's lots of great things. We're in, in the works right now, uh, trying to get our season booked and, and we're going to start asking for um, support through our corporate sponsorships in, in the early um, 2021. That sounds great. It sounds like so much fun. I'm glad that uh, Sierra Leone is getting involved. I just love her. Yeah. I can't emphasize, though, the importance of giving. Uh, today is Giving Tuesday, obviously, and we need to make sure music comes back downtown Dayton, and it's free for everyone to enjoy. So please donate to the Levitt Dayton by visiting Levitt Dayton's website. The address is on the screen right there in front of you, levittdayton.org slash donate. Uh, give as much as you can and all will be appreciated. I would like to thank all of our guests today for sharing and celebrating the Levitt Dayton story with us today. 
We had so much fun and there's so much more for you to enjoy tonight. Coming up next is a special showcase of students from our Levitt Dayton Fall Songwriting Workshop. Let's listen in and hear what they have created together and what they have to say about the world. At 7 p.m., join Dave Alexander from Mix 107.7 as he hosts Dave Higginson of the Plain White Tees for performance and Q&A. See you all soon at the lawn on downtown Dave Hall Plaza at the Levitt. Dayton, thanks a lot. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you.